Aloha mai kāko. Aloha mai kāko. Um, welcome to day two of the seventh annual Lahui Hawaii Research Conference here at the Aimen Center and the adjoining University of Hawaii at Manoa Campus. Uh, good morning. My name is Willie Kauai. I'm the Director of Native Hawaiian Student Services in the School of Hawaiian Knowledge, Hawaii Nui Akea. Um, before moving on, I want to also mahalo the staff here at the Ayman East-West Center for being an ongoing supporter of this venue and of this conference. So mahalo Ayman, um, and also again, mahalo to the extra extraordinary uh, media support teams of both Kanaiokana and OEV TV uh, for making the live streaming and technical support of this venue happen. So thank you. To all of you. Also, like to um, mahalo yesterday's uh, keynote panel that helped to open this conference. Um, that present title, that presentation title, Maolelo Mai Kaaina Moana, featuring a discussion with Professor Lorenz Gonshore, Professor Kelani Cook, and moderated by PhD candidate Ilima Long. I think this presentation got us to think about the messiness, right, as was stated, of Oceania. Uh, also, the possibilities of past and present solidarities that exist across Moana Nui Akea, and also the many lessons and strategies learned along the way. I think it also got us to remember that in reorienting ourselves to the Pacific, we also teach each other who we are and who we once were. Along with Um, also, a little plug, if you haven't already read Professor Kealani's uh, most recent book, Return to Kohiki, uh, and, and also Lorenz Ganshore's book, uh, Hawaii, A Power in the World, make sure to add those books to your queue. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Ilima Long for moderating yesterday's panel. Um, Ilima, uh, we are also patiently awaiting her forthcoming dissertation project, uh, which will look at the history of Kanaka labor and unionizing and the political power that was wielded therein. Um, forthcoming work by Ili Malong. Today, of course, we have another highly anticipated keynote presentation, Guns, Germs, and the Colonial Genome, um, by Professor Keolu Fox from the University of California, San Diego, who I will introduce shortly. Um, before going on, um, along with Thanking the keynote panelists, I would also like to thank all of you, the conference registrants, and especially the student presentations. Yesterday, I think there was close to 33 student presentations. So thank you all students for making this year's conference a success. Thank you. And of course, today we have another exciting program uh, featuring breakout sessions after today's keynote. Uh, we will also have poster presentations down in the lunch area. We have Hawaiian food from Kanak Attack. And this evening, we have a screening uh, from director Tai Sanga's uh, most recent film, Hokulea, Finding the Language of the Navigator. 
Also, this will be accompanied by uh, a special moderation moderated panel by Tai Sanga and also Kaiulani Murphy, uh, captain of Hokulea, that will take place this evening. Before we open up uh, and, and get this day officially started, I would like to feature, feature a couple of, of programs that Native Hawaiian Student Services offers here on our campus. Uh, these are programs that engage our students with Hawaiian faculty, with Hawaiian research, and with Hawaiian history. Um, these small clips, um, the first will, um, will emphasize the Halipa'i, Hale Pa'i program. Uh, this is a student publication project uh, which was initially uh, created in order to create a children's book series with the research from our Hawaiian Youth Abroad student alumni and illustrated by Hawaiian students at UHM. In 2022, our first student authored an illustrated publication, Kohua Ka'i A Timoteo Halilio, was published with grant funds to disseminate over 4,000 copies for free to our Hawaiian Immersion and Charter Schools and partners across all islands. The second publication, Kohua Ka'i A Liholiho and Kamamalu, which we'll feature today uh, in 2003, was similarly distributed with NHSS team and visiting schools for book readings and other engagement work. In 2024, two more publications uh, will be released uh, as well. Um, let's cue up the... Aloha, my name is Helena E. Saidudwa, and I am the translator for this book. Aloha, my name is Alison Nuesca Franco, and I am the author of this second book, a part of Halepa'i student publication entitled Kahua Ka'i Ali Holiho and Kamamalu. Aloha, my name is Kamehu Kawikahana Marati, and I'm the illustrator for book two, Kahua Ka'i Ali Holiho and Kamamalu. Um, the Hawaiian community, Hawaiian language community, for this kind of book that we created. We're happy with the results. I was really grateful to have felt the support. So I actually got to see Keiki and Hamana engaging with the book. Our vision that we had realized was, was a really rewarding experience. For the topic of this book, it actually came from the research that I did a part of the Hawaiian News Abroad program in 2019. So for Keiki and first-time readers, um, weren't too familiar with our Mo'olalo Hawaii or Hawaiian history. This would be a good introduction to a little known area in our history. Just in itself is a story that we haven't heard in its entirety, if that makes sense. There's a lot of research that I had to do, that I had to pull together from Nupepa, from other scholars that have done research on the Holiho and Kamamalu. It was difficult to figure out what exactly they did while they're on their huaka'i. So being able to piece those, those details together um, in this book, I think, is what's the exciting pieces to, to look forward to. When I first started out this project, I didn't have much expectations. I just knew the work I was putting in, and I was proud of the work that I was creating. Once this project came out and the scale of it, I was, I was really surprised, but mostly just grateful. And it did allow me to step back for a second and just be proud of it. The difficulty in general is just trying to figure out how can we take this research and actually create a mole level that is concise and that could be used, you know, beyond myself, but to uh, share it to the Lahui. It was really fun getting to see all the research that was put into it and taking the pictures and implementing it into my work. and. At the end of it, overall, creating a scene or a place that may be recognizable to some people. I thought that was a cool experience. Yeah, I think that the Halepa'i is, is going to be very successful because it does um, what so few other Pukekamali'i uh, or children books do, is that um, it incorporates primary Hawaiian documentation. I think it's following its trajectory. It's, it's doing what it's supposed to. Hawaii 
palikano o Hawaii ya Britania. Kaliki me kahana kona mua, kamehe me pai ea hoi, ua make make nui oli huli hoi hoi kai kai kapina ma waino o Britania nui a me Hawaii. No laila, polo oli huli ho kama malu o me ko lawa po e ukali no ka ina e, ya ka ahumanu lawa o kawikiaoli ka no holula ana. A ohe moku lele ye maula, no ka lohi o na moku holo kai, he lo ihi wale ko li huli huma hua ka ina. O ila ko e holo ana, Wa kuu kamaku i Rio de Janeiro na kamakana ana yahu ula i na kanaka koi koi o Laila, o Barazila hoi. O yei oli holi ho maa i ladana, nui ka hoi hoi o ko Laila poe i kahana ka mo i a mo i wahine ko hawe i pae aina. Ma muli o ia hoi hoi, wa kipa ia lawa ma ko lako ho kele, wa palapala ia ko lako ho kai man manu pepa liki ole o Enelani. Ia lako e kali ane ki kini o Enelani, Wa lea lea o liho liho ka maa malu o me ko lawa po e ukali ka paa ina ana. Me ka nana ana ki kahi mau hana kiaka ma ki ano he mau hoa ki pa hano hano. Wa ki pa na li i na kula a me na hauka pila li ki oleo e ni lani. Me ka mnao e hoi hoi mai ki kahi i ki ya hawei. Wa kakao o liho liho i na leka no kona hoa ka i ana ya kala ni moku ka ahumanu a me kawi ki aoli. Ma mua i ki o ko lawa mahina e kolu ma la dana, wa pau oli holi ho lawa o ka maa malu i ka mai, i ka maki ki umi kumavalu i wakalu o ka maha. Ma hope i ho ko lawa hala ana i ka po, wa hui ki kahi o ko lawa ukali me kini ki o ki ka haa. Wa kau maha vale na kanaka hawai i ka hala ana o ko la ko mo i. E no nae, wa i kai ka e no ka plina o hawai i lawa o Britania nui, ka hana ali huli ho maa. complete uh, 100% student driven uh, there was faculty involvement um, mahalo Malani Balutsky for her her direction um, but many of uh, but but what you seen was a hundred percent student produced uh, including the videography by Hezekiah uh, who is behind us helping with that media as well too so um, the other the other um, uh, short film that I wanted to highlight as well too is our internship program uh, the Kekaulike Internship Program uh, places our Hawaiian students in different sectors of uh, our Hawaiian community organizations with the idea for them to be a liaison or a bridge between the university and that particular community organization. Um, in this particular, uh, in this year's Kekaulike Internship uh, Program, we are focusing in on the archives. Um, so at this uh, moment, we are taking applications for those interested in participating in an internship program that would place you in one of the physical or digital repositories. We have a small um, film that I would like to include to highlight that. From my friend Kalani Nui, we, we uh, reconnected and she was just like, oh cool, like there's this internship that NHSS is offering, I think you'd be perfect for it. And so I pushed it off for a couple of weeks and then after I was like, okay, let me give it a try. Thank you to Native Hawaiian Student Services for making it possible to have them here. And you know, they're converting to staff if they're, if they're able and willing, which is always a good sign. This is it. we're not just trying to have fun here. We're trying to give them skills that make them employable. And so I am happy to say that I would write them recommendations to make sure that they continue in their career paths. One thing I really love about working at Punanaleo is being able to, to see the outcome of, of the work that, that these kumu are putting into. It is, I've only been there for a short while, but I can't tell you how rewarding the feeling is when you're talking to a keiki and they, they respond back to you in Olelo and you can just like have a full-blown conversation and they're like three, four, five years old. The experience as of our interns um, at Punanaleo, how that helps them is to see if they have that kumu itch, if they want to be a kumu, if they want to pursue 
um, being a kumu for higher grades because we are only three to five year olds and that way they can see if this is something that they want to do or if they want to do something else with their olalo hawaii like curriculum development or if they want to pursue another um, ala that's not kumu, being a kumu um, that helps them to figure it out i actually um i used to be a hawaiian studies major and for me my favorite part of being Hawaiian studies was learning about our history and so you know Hawaiian Historical Society I just thought it makes sense for me. We've had about four interns from the program so far and my current two uh, bring about a fresh breath of air sometimes to this very stagnant space that we can sit in and it's very powerful to have the students interact and touch this material but also in turn providing a bigger access and a wider audience beyond the walls of HHS. I got to hold Liho Liho's diary okay and that was really cool to me like really really cool like when I held that thing I was just like imagining I mean like he held it, you know, he wrote on it, like, and this is, like, something he did every night. And it just, like, made me feel, like, connected to the past more. So, I don't know. You get to do some really cool things. There's, like, so many reasons why I think somebody, or, like, I mean, if you care about the community, like, I think this is such a great way to get involved. And, like, meet other people involved and just, like, start a foundation, you know? Um, that you're gonna use for the rest of your life. Like, I highly urge everybody to find their own vahipana and to find their own space that they feel they are safe in, in their community. Because Native Books is my vahipana and I'm so blessed to have um, found this place. And I highly urge anybody to find their space, whether it is Native Books or any other internship in Kekolike and NHSS. I would say just go for it. <laughs> just sign up. You know, once you once you get into those spaces and you you meet the kind of people that you'll be working with, I assure you, you you will know then whether or not this career is for you. And it gives you really really good experience, working experience in the field of your interest or the the site of your interest. Really, it's an it's an invaluable experience. I would do this 100 times over. <laughs> So that application is still open um, this year. I think we are partnering with Hamilton Library, again, Hawaiian Historical Society, the Bishop Museum, Punanaleo, Kekula Kayapuneo, Anuinoi, and other repositories. Um, another program I want to highlight really quick without a video, uh, NHSS uh, does and organizes a summer institute. Um, these are courses for Hawaiian students that are um, without the cost of tuition. Uh, this year, we're offering a menu of up to, I think, 15 classes um, in both summer session one and two. Uh, that application is open as well. And the last program I want to highlight, which also has another open application, is our Hawaiian Youths Abroad. Um, as mentioned, um, NHSS took two cohorts in 2018 and 2019 to three different countries in Europe to trace the extensive Hawaiian footprint that exists in the world. Uh, this year we'll be doing the same. We'll be taking a cohort of students to uh, the South Pacific, uh, where we'll be retracing our ancestral connections there, um, and also looking at uh, the contemporary issues that are affecting those places. Uh, this year we are slated to go to uh, Tahiti, Raiatea, and Mo'orea. Uh, this application is also open as well. Um, with that said, um, I want to um, introduce our, our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Keolu Fox. Oh, Kalamai, sorry. Um, before moving on, um, if you have questions for the keynote uh, speaker, please uh, um, use your camera. I, I, I'm, I'm for loss of the word. Use your camera. <laughs> Scan the code. There you go. Um, and you can... Um, you can put out your questions in that program, um, and we'll read it off. For others that are um, 
technology disabled like I am, um, we will have cards that you can write out your question. Um, with that said, um, I want to uh, move on and introduce um, Kyolu Fox. Uh, he is the co-founder of the NATO, sorry, Kyolu Fox is the co-founder of the Native Biodata Consortium, a nonprofit research institute led by indigenous scientists and tribal members. He's an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, where he is a co-founder and co-director of the UCSD Indigenous Futures Institute. Kiolu is the first Kanaka Maoli to receive a doctorate in genome science. His work focuses on the connection between data as a resource and the emerging value of genomic health data from indigenous communities. In his spare time, Dr. Fox can be seen up and down the Southern California coast um, in his pursuit to be an aspiring professional surfer. But with that, say, uh, that said, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Kiolu Fox. Aloha kako, everybody. Nobody wants to sit in the front row? It's like school. Okay. All right. Oh, mahalo. All right, I'm gonna, it's, uh, it's a huge honor to get to give you this keynote address. I'm a huge fan of NHSS. I think the Summer Institute is incredible. I think the production on all of those new pieces of media are amazing. And um, when are you guys going to Tahiti? No, no, just teasing. But uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about some interesting new projects that really focus on health in Hawaii and Wananui broadly. <clears throat> um, and I've titled it Guns, Germs, and the Colonial Genome. So one of the inspirations for this is I get a lot of students and even my own inquiry and the scientific questions we want to ask around something like genomics. Are you guys familiar with genomics, genetics, genome sequencing? It's kind of what we work on. Genome sequencing and editing. Sequencing is reading the genome. Editing is kind of finding typos and managing to, to change them if they contribute to something like sickle cell or cancer. Um, but the vast majority of these studies don't focus on our people. So we've made that an, an initiative. And we're going to talk about three projects that really focus and center Hawaii and the Pacific. And uh, let me see if this thing works. Oh, whoops. Well, how do I go back, bro? My bad. Swipe. Oh, swipe, okay. So, Willie, you're not the only one that's challenged. <laughs> um, so, as Willie alluded to, we started our Indigenous Futures Institute for the University of California which is a new initiative, and it's modeled after a lot of the success of our community and our people here in Hawaii. And many of you know we created some of the first color newspapers in the world, put electricity in Iolani Palace well before the White House, uh, put out the playbook for universal health care in Hawaii, and many, many, many other things. So when we're talking about futurism and we're talking about using cutting edge tools like genome sequencing and genome editing to empower our people, that's nothing new. We've been doing that for a very long time here, okay? That's our kupuna, that's our kuleana, if you will. Um, my mo'oku Ohana and my whole ohana is from Mokunui, originally Kohala, but now we live in the epicenter of Hawaiian culture, Hilo. <laughs> Um, but something that's special about the Big Island is that it is a really interesting place when you think about science. Whether that's indigenous science, which is what we've been doing for millennia, that's how we got here, or Western science. And there's a fair amount of kind of scientific tourism going on, if you will. There's a tremendous amount of biological diversity. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of soil, like... Uh, Papakolea, for example, here, the Green Sand Beach. But there's also this complexity to it beyond that. There's the history with the military industrial complex. There's the tourism industrial complex that make this 
this place complicated. And it, it's not just the most diverse biologically, it's also the home of the highest number of invasive species in the world. It's also the extinction capital of the world. So it's like all of these things all at once. And I think everyone here knows that. But if you begin to look at that through a scientific lens, it, it really shapes the type of questions you, you ask and you think about and you dream about. Well, my connection is lost. Could you go to the next one, maybe? Or? <clears throat> so it's not just that it's biologically complex, but for human beings, it's the most diverse place in America, if you think this is part of America. And that's really interesting, too. So when we look at some of these counties, well, I've got to put my glasses and help you guys out here. This is census data. And you can see that four of Hawaii's counties rank among the top 15 most diverse, diverse counties in America. Hawaii County, where I'm from, is number one, followed by Maui County, number two, Kauai County, number four, and then Honolulu County, where we are right now, number 11. And if you look at that tapestry of diversity, you can see all types of different communities of people that make up who we are today. Now, our diaspora and migratory history is interesting because it's, it's really complex and it's why Hawaiian people are so amazing and beautiful and, and all of these things that we love to, to celebrate. But it also contributes to our susceptibility to disease. So I want to talk to you about three kind of projects that we've worked on, uh, three projects I'm really proud of. The first is about paths and timing of the peopling of Polynesia and how we, we know when we got here, beyond what your tutu said, right? And then I want to talk about the origins of leprosy bacteria in Hawaii, in Oceania broadly, Ma'ipake. And we'll talk about that from the point of view of a genomic history and how we know that. Ma'ipake famously means the scourge from China. So how do we know that? Why did our ancestors say that? Can we confirm that hypothesis using modern methods? And then the final one we'll talk about is the gout epidemic, which has mostly been talked about and discussed as like a neglected tropical disease. And we worked hand in hand with the vice president of French Polynesia to create a comprehensive epidemiological study in Tahiti uh, to, to determine just, just how bad our susceptibility to gout is and why, okay? And they call it my uu, which is kind of funny. Okay, so the first one up. So we, we've all seen this figure before where we're looking at Polynesia, we're looking at the Pacific Ocean, the best, biggest, oldest ocean on planet Earth. We know that our ancestors developed incredible types of technology like double hold voyaging canoe or va'a and used all these types of ecological metadata, bird migration patterns, the green glint on the bottom of a cloud from a lagoon, all of these things, this sum total that our ancestors used to get here. But the timing oftentimes doesn't come from our communities. These time estimates often come from Western science estimates. Um, and I've always been fascinated with that idea. It's like, where do these unidirectional arrows come from? Where do these time estimates come from? Uh, because we don't just go one direction. Voyaging, if you've ever hold a hold on sailing on a, on a vala, it's like it's not one, one directional, right? So this is a really reductionist kind of look at our history and accomplishments. And if it's not coming from our mouths, it becomes reduced, if that makes sense. Um, but there are all these different lines of evidence that we use to, or academics use, I should say, to come up with these estimates. So you have archaeological estimates, right, that we get from carbon dating or different things. Um, famously, here's the Moai in Rapa Nui. You have applied mathematics. So in the 1970s, people would come up with these complex equations, mostly in England, and they would say, okay, well, Hawaii is located across the border, or across the border, the, <laughs> the equator. And because of that, 
it uses a different calculus. So the stars you'll need to use are different from the system that might have been created by our ancestors when they were in Tahiti or Marquesas, for example. So the statistical chance that you find a Mokunui is a lot lower than other places. And so you can kind of come up with simulations. It's kind of interesting way to think about that. Then you have linguistics. So you have all of the similarities and differences that we have from other Polynesian languages. Everybody says Manu. Everybody says Moana. Not everybody says Aloha. Some people say Aroha in Aotearoa, for example. We all, we all know that, but like empirically digging into those questions is another line of evidence. And so tying all of them together allows us to kind of confirm specific hypotheses, right? But the one that's my bag that I have a PhD in is genetics. And so you can also look at human genome sequence data and you can understand our diaspora. And that's a field called population genetics. And I won't get into all the details of how we do this mathematically under the hood, um, but I'm happy to uh, if you have specific questions. <clears throat> and, okay, so one of the most interesting questions is kind of kind of kind of starts with scientific inquiry from the Western point of view when Cook arrives, right? And this is a image of how this started from Herb Kane, and then famously this is the image of how it ended, which we all know. And <clears throat> I wanted to bring up this because I think it's really interesting because oftentimes we're forced to collaborate with people that aren't from our cultures around things that have to do with our history. And so we're negotiating how we interpret data, scientific data that has to do with our identity. So beyond this being whatever, a paper in nature or science, uh, it has a, a very different impact in our communities, which we all know. Um, but Cook, for example, came to the Pacific to look into something called the transit of Venus for scientific inquiry. So that's no different than scientists that are not from here coming to the Big Island to study, I don't know, rapid ohia death, right? Just to make the parallel. Um, and he, along the way, runs into this guy, Tupaya. Who's heard of Tupaya? Put your hand up if you've heard this man's name before. That's good. That's good. That's good. Tupaya, by all accounts, was a genius. He was a person who was really good at a lot of things. It is said that he uh, had memorized the locations of over a thousand different island ar archipelagos in the Pacific. He learned English like that. Um, there, there are all kinds of legends about this guy. But some of the things we do know is that Cook was not a celebrated navigator until he meets his golden goose. And that's Tupaya. And he was a talented artist. Imagine never touching a paintbrush or having a familiarity with like Western style painting and then just creating things like this along your travels. You know, we all have some cousin who's just good at everything and it's annoying. The guy was probably handsome too. But, uh, but the reason I bring all of that up um, is because we're talking about collaboration and the way we view the world, right? And the theme for this year's NHSS uh, meeting is all about this idea, right? This is about how we view maps in the world spatially. So imagine Cook and Tupaya coming together on one of the first maps of the Pacific represented in this way. And this is the product they created. It's really interesting if you look at it. This is not how Tupaya probably visualized and imagined space and time and physics. But this is the translation of that in a collaboration with Cook. And it's a really fascinating artifact. It brings up a bunch of questions about how we collaborate with people that aren't from our cultures. It's like, who's dominating the narrative? What is the end product? What is the power balance or imbalance that exists? You should be thinking about that in the projects that you create long term, especially if you're serving our Lahui. And that brings up a series of really interesting questions. It's like, 
who, again, who's in control of this narrative? Who's biasing the data? And now in this era of AI, whatever that means to you, that's more important than ever. How we bias data. And we're going to get into that a little more and how important that is for things like predicting health states and understanding health disparities and the susceptibility of disease to specific communities of people. Um, and then whose hypotheses are we testing? And finally, this is the most important, is it even your question to ask? Right? Even as a Hawaiian person, I'm not going to be asking questions, as, as a person from Big Island, I'm not going to be asking questions about Maui. That's not my kuleana. I'm not from there. I'll leave that to those guys. If they need help, give me a ring. Um, and then in the 1940s, we have something called the birth of experimental archaeology. You have this guy, Thor Heyerdahl, popularizing these incorrect ideas about the direction of our diaspora. Again, this guy's Norwegian. He's not from Hawaii. He's not from Marquesas. But he's theorizing that we come from South America in the wrong direction. That becomes the narrative. National Geographic is there. People are making documentaries. This narrative persists. Even though this guy crashes his va'a and doesn't make it, that becomes popularized and engraved into history, even though it's not legitimate in every single way. Then in the 70s, you have these guys, which you're going to see a documentary about this evening, I believe. And they have to rewrite the narrative of something that we all know to be true. We, all of our ancestors knew this to be true. And they build Hokulea, and they sail it to Tahiti, and they have what looks like the biggest party ever. And they're celebrating our accomplishments. And that is the birth of the Hawaiian Renaissance, when our whole culture was on life support. Nobody was speaking Hawaiian. I think the contrast is really, really important, because that's Hawaiian people doing Hawaiian things, versus Norwegian people sinking boats. OK. And it means that we're constantly having to right? We're constantly having to walk backwards into the future and take advice from our ancestors and looking at what your tutu said was probably right. And so sometimes when we're approaching these scientific questions, right, like reading the genome to understand where we come from, even though we already know where we come from, it's about writing the narrative and doing it in places where maybe uh, folks didn't, didn't believe us. Um, and that's why it felt really good to publish a big paper on these ideas using our own genome in Mo'oku Auhau to understand where we came from with community consent building projects in community and doing this and refining those boundaries, seeing our languages used in a journal like Nature, publishing and looking at an author list and seeing people from our communities in that lineup. That's not how things worked in the past. Okay, But that doesn't mean we control the narrative. Again, you could publish a paper in Nature and science is still going to say ignorant stuff like this. No one could have predicted DNA surprises on how Polynesia was settled. Well, that's just not true. I just showed you the thing from 1976 with Hokulea. So, and, and look how old that picture is. Why are they doing that? But if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. Oh, man. Uh-oh. you got to go to the next one. Oh, mean. So I got to write a little piece for Scientific American about our work. And I got to take a picture. Anybody know where that is? Keokaha, the capital of, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, I'm teasing, yeah. Um, and that is the va'a that I get to learn to sail on. That's Keokahi. And that is a beautiful thing. And that's a modern representation of things that we do every day. It's how we're distilling and talking about those things. Did I break it or something? I, I wash my hands. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you about uh, our, our second story, and this has to do with the origins of Ma'ipake in Oceania.
and a tra- kind of genomic history, I've always been fascinated with that question. Like, if we call it ma'ipake, how do we know that's where it's from? Now, I just told you we have modern tools to sequence the genomes of human beings. We can also do that with bacteria. We can do that with tuberculosis. We can do that with COVID. We can do that with the genome bacteria of leprosy. And if you can look back in time and understand the diversity, you could understand where it came from, right? Did it come from the HMS Endeavor? Did it come from Chinese traders, Spanish whalers? I don't know. But that's something that we can get to the bottom of using modern tools. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. Just Here's a look at some of the collaborators that were on this project. We worked hand-in-hand hand on this project with Queens, prioritizing Native Hawaiian health since 1859. That is 30 years before the establishment of the National Institutes of Health. Just putting that into context for you. Um, and we know that all types of people end up in Hawaii because of the sugarcane industry and big ag kind of industry. And that's directly related to the overthrow of the Native Hawaiian Kingdom. And with them, they bring all types of different technologies to expedite yield, to industrialize the process, right? Like this scythe, which is made of metal. Um, and that changes in a lot of our agricultural practices that's here on campus. And there are a series of questions that, that kind of come up. Some of the most interesting questions to me were, where did it come from? Right? Where did leprosy come from, the bacteria? When does it arrive? How do we know that? And then, how has it impacted our health today? If we know that the introduction of diseases like ma'ipake and smallpox have nearly wiped out a lot of indigenous people from Cook to Cortez, you know, how has that shaped the genomes of contemporary Kanaka? And how does that contribute to our susceptibility to disease today? Could that have a role in how we manage inflammation? Does that impact our susceptibility to type 2 diabetes? Lots of different outstanding questions, okay? Heavy stuff. And so again, here's another one of those imagined interaction moments. Um, and this is a really cool piece of data from Kamehameha Schools in collaboration with the Pew Research Center. And here are some of the things we know historically ar- in, in, throughout archives. We know in 1776, Cook arrives. We know the first case of Ma'ipake pops up in 1835. We know that the largest case of medical stigmatization in the establishment of the leprosy, leprosarium, on Kalaupapa, first in Kalavao, starts around that time. Okay? And if you're not familiar, it's a beautiful but strange place because of that history of medical stigmatization. Um, and here's a little, little flyover. Is it working? No? I don't know. Anyways, you had to be there. But I think it's a really interesting, polarizing place. And it's also because of that stigmatization. It has a dark stigma. But when I went there, I was surprised at how beautiful it is. Physically beautiful. And I think that's a really, really important thing to remember. When we're talking about things like leprosy and Hansen's disease, you have to approach them critically with care. And this is like the highest level of doing pono science, in my opinion. Um, And when we look through archival images, you can see that these are fumigation houses. This is before we understood, as as a civilization, how we understood what might be a therapeutic application here, antibiotics, things like dapsome and other things. But at the time, that wasn't known. So there, were, uh, there was a lot of uh, stigmatization and other things that were going on here. And here's a, a look at the inside of some of these fumigation spaces. And then here are two young Kanakamali who had their lives taken away from them. These are medicalized photos. And I know they're heavy, but I think it's really important 
to think about what that legacy is and how we move forward from that without repeating the same mistakes. Um, and we know that doing research on people who don't want research done on them has consequences globally, especially in Hawaii. Um, we got to had the the uh, the honor of putting on a whole exhibit about this at at the Bishop Museum called Regenerations, and we focused on many of those ideas. And it is in direct conflict with the sovereignty of our people. So there's always this tension that is represented in the media that it's oh it's culture versus science, but it's the culture of science that becomes polarizing all too often when we're talking about our community. And I just put this picture up here just to, to say less. If you know, you know. But again, these questions exist. It's like, where did this come from? The parallel, I think that's really interesting, is that when we were working on this project, there was another pathogen that had come from China that was impacting global health. And that's COVID. And there was a lot of stigmatization about that. Then President Donald Trump was saying things like, it's the Kung flu. It's a very ignorant thing to say. Um, but you have to be very careful about how you, you, you work through these projects and how that, the data from these projects are interpreted long term. We know a lot of things about leprosy. We know that there are still 215,000 cases of uh, new leprosy cases every year. So generally when we talk about this, it's, oh, well, this is a disease from the Bible and this doesn't exist anymore, but that's very much not the case. Um, there are all kinds of new Hansen's disease cases every year, and a lot of that has to do with failed infrastructure and a lack of access to things like antibiotics. And um, that is less about the achievements of new therapies, but more about how we establish access, right? Um, we know that it's caused by bacteria. We can look at the population genetics of this again. We can sequence the genome, assemble it, and compare it to other bacteria. We know that there's zoonotic transfer, which means that certain animals like armadillos and chimpanzees and squirrels can be vectors or carriers of leprosy as well. I know those pictures are pretty gross. We know that certain strains are antibiotic resistant, meaning you could get it. I'm not trying to scare you guys, but this is the reality. You could get it, and there's no antibiotics for you that work. That's pretty terrifying. So sequencing the genome of a lot of these things is very, very interesting and important. And so rather than looking at this like a disease from the past, it's like what new insights can we get from understanding its origin? Here's a, a look at its genome. It's a rod-shaped bacteria. Its genome is 3.3 million base pairs. And one of the most interesting things that pops up later in 2002 is a research group from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where there's a, a, a scientist who's actually from Sri Lanka, starts looking at and understanding leprosy's role in rodents. And he starts to see that there is a relationship around cell turnover and pluripotency, like stem cells. So what he starts seeing is these rats, they don't develop liver cancer. So there's a relationship between Hansen's disease and a lower incidence of the second cause of death on planet Earth, which is cancer. So there are key insights into gain there. Um, and I know it's Friday, everybody's going to be drinking. That doesn't mean that you get to just go out. No, I'm, I'm joking, but it's, it's a fascinating new avenue for research and science. Rather than looking at this like, this is an opportunity to stigmatize people you know, this is a thing of the past. There are new things that we can learn. And so working with Queens, we went through a bank of old slides, biopsy slides. And what happens is you do a biopsy, you store it in wax, then it goes through something called a microtome, which is like a 
miniature deli slicer. And then you affix it to a glass slide. And then you dye it. And you determine whether the bacteria is present or not. But that also means that the bacteria's genome is present on the slide. So you can go back in time and you can sequence the genome of bacteria and understand its genome. And then you can compare it. So this is me working in an ancient genomics laboratory in the state of Arizona. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was really hot in there. But that is us identifying leprosy. And then that is us sequencing and assembling the ancient genome of leprosy from Oceana for the first time. And then publishing it and understanding that we identified two unknown and unidentified strains of leprosy. Now, the verdict is still out on where it came from, but we're taking incremental steps forward into understanding its origin in Oceana. Okay, now the last kind of story I want to tell you about is very interesting. So we, I kind of alluded to this in the title of this talk, Guns, Germs, and the Colonial Genome. And we know that there have been population collapses where you have the introduction of diseases like smallpox and moipake and how that shapes uh, population declines in indigenous communities. And the way that was represented in the book that uh, that Guns, Germs, and Steel book is not accurate. But it's a lot easier for conquistador colonizers to impose their will on the Aztec Empire when 90% of the population has died of a pathogen or a disease. Okay, So it's not guns, germs, and steel. It's more like germs, germs, and germs in that sense. But identifying those impacts in the genomes of contemporary peace people is possible today. And so this piece of literature shows that by sequencing ancient genomes of people and modern genomes of people in British Columbia amongst the Catla community, they were able to actually detect a shift and a change in something called HLA or the human leukocyte antigen, which is involved in the immune system which makes sense if you think about it, right? If you lived like our ancestors did, everybody here is uh, from that, that kind of bottleneck or population collapse. Somebody in our, our family survived. That's who we are today. But it also shifts the variation that we see among contemporary populations in regions like HLA shaping our immune systems. That's what they're showing here. Okay? And so, again, from Cook to Cortez, it's not guns, germs, and steel. It's germs, germs, and germs. And this is just kind of a cartoon of how, how that looks. So I'm just trying to explain how this works. Okay? So you have an original population of people. You have something called a bottleneck event. And then you have a surviving population of people over time. You have the introduction of a specific pathogen, and then you have reduced HLA diversity. Okay? That's the idea. That's the hypothesis. And so during the pandemic, I was focusing on a lot of the things I would see in the news. We were seeing things like Pacific Islanders have the highest rates of COVID in LA County. Now, that could be incidental or anecdotal because we live in homes where we have multiple generations of people a lot of the times. That's my case. But, but there's something there. It's an interesting trend that was reported in the LA Times. Okay? Okay. So finally, I want to wrap it up by connecting those types of population bottleneck events to something like gout prevalence, which is amongst the highest in the world in Oceania. Okay? We got to spend a lot of time working on a national initiative with the vice president's office. It's been really fun, really awesome, exploring the prevalence of gout. Now, one thing we know a lot of times in, in, in our communities is that we have a really high 
you know, level of a disease perhaps, but we don't know what the exact numbers are. Like, is it 1 in 10, 1 in 30, 1 in 40? And you need epidemiological data to look into those things. But the French government, as a colonizer of French Polynesia, hasn't really been forthcoming about prioritizing those types of health projects. Oh, no. I'm doomed. <laughs> oh, oh, shoot. Oh, I went too far. Oh, no. Sorry, bro. Sorry, guys. Call on my technical difficulty. Oh, could you go to the next one, please? Thank you. And so what we did is we worked with the federal government there, and we established a large-scale study. And we modeled this after a sort of ahupua'a recruitment process where we divided up each district into the ahupua'as that exist there, and then we asked people if they wanted to participate in a national study around gout. And they did. And so... One thing we did that's unique is that if you're following the news, you see that genetic information is very valuable, right? Who knows 23andMe? Put your hand up if you've ever heard of that. Who's done it before? It's okay. It's okay. Shame. No, I'm teasing. But, <laughs> but they sold your data to GSK for $300 million. That information is worth a lot of money. So you don't just all aloha all the time hand it out. Right? So with this study, what we did is we created a financial circular economic mechanism where if you contributed to the study and there's a long-term drug that's developed from that information or your data is stored, you receive 4% of the revenue and profits. You also receive free access to the drug. Unprecedented. Very disruptive to big pharma. And that is a way to get people equity in the development of new therapies that focus on our communities in a space where 95% of clinical trials focus on holidays. Okay? So it's kind of unique in a number of different ways. Now we published this work and this study in a journal called The Lancet and we worked closely with this company, Variant Bio, who helped us develop the financial mechanism. Um, and this idea is called benefit sharing. Free access to drugs. We use a specific type of genome sequencing called mid-pass genome sequencing. Happy to talk about that. It's kind of technical. But all along the way, we prioritize grassroots research and democratizing technology. We used point-of-care technology, which means rather than funneling people into sterile hospital environments, most of the time, we brought a lot of these technologies into sp community spaces, like mobile ultrasound, mobile genome sequencing, and, and other things. These are just a few examples. Um, here's us using something called a myoton. This is a device that you can muzzle, me uh, measure mul uh, muscle density. And then we use kind of old school classic techniques too, like uh, that blood spot technique um, to look at different people's blood types. And what we learned throughout this process and this project is that one in seven individuals have gout in French Polynesia, which is nuts. It's really high. It's a problem. And there are drugs that are available, but none of those drugs were developed for our communities. We also started looking into that HLA region that we were talking about to see and what we're seeing is a relationship between specific types of L HLA, the management of inflammation, and the development of uric acid and uric acid crystals, which lead directly to gout. And this work is ongoing, but what I'm trying to do, I won't belabor it, is connect it to this idea of like, what is colonialism's impact on the genome of indigenous people? What types of empirical evidence can we use to, 
to further and develop those types of scientific questions. How can you use science to achieve justice? And again, this work is ongoing, and I know there are some kind of bigger ideas, but I will leave it with that so that we can have time for questions. And I just wanted to say mahalo nui to everybody, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions, yeah? I am. I think it's cool. I love those guys. Yeah. The Eno Sahana and all those guys. Yeah. 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 I think we need more work like that where we're, you know, in control, if you will. Anybody else? Any? does and it's a good question and absolutely uh, every time you know I think in the case of this uh, gout project it's like people people you know what's cool about taking something like a, a mobile ultrasound and bringing it into a community and kind of like de-black boxing how things work it's really interesting because like that company wanted to charge us hundreds of dollars for the transmission if you ever like you know the oil you put on top of like a hapai woman? Yeah. They wanted to charge us, I think, hundreds of dollars. And what some of our clinicians on the ground level figured out is that they could just use coconut oil and it's free. So, I mean, that, that type of innovation, that type of like Kani Kapila stuff, that's something that we're not uh, prioritizing, but we should be. Or trying to encourage it. Like, I think the Silicon Valley people call it user-led innovation. Yeah. Anybody else? Got any gotchas? No? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So that concludes uh, the um, uh, early keynote um, speaker. Uh, sessions, uh, please uh, start to make your way up to uh, the student presentations, with our, which are on the second floor, so right above. There's an elevator here, but there's also uh, stairs on both ends. Um, bathrooms are downstairs, and we will see everybody at lunch shortly. Have a good day.